Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to New Books in Intellectual History, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Alexandra Otolia Baird, host of the channel, and today I'm talking to Leah David about her new book, The Past Can't Heal Us The Dangers of Mandating Memory in the Name of Human Rights, published by Cambridge University Press in 2020. Leah, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me here. Leah, it's an absolute delight. And the book is an incredibly powerful and, dare I say, even provocative um, discussion that we're going to have today. But before we, we get to the content of the book, would you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself and how your research led up to The Past Can't Heal Us? Okay, let's start. So, well, uh, this book is a product not so much of my intellectual trajectory, which came later on, I would say, but of my bodily experiences. So what do I mean by that? Whereas many scholars uh, draw the inspiration for their work from their intellectual inquiries, this book reflects more than anything else my life trajectory. So I was born and raised in what was then Yugoslavia, a multi-ethnic communist socialist country that I would say successfully for the period of time, at least, uh, brought together different nations and ethnic groups around the socialist slogan of brotherhood and unity. You know, national, ethnic and religious differences were not ignored as often argued, but instead were framed as a backstage issue of minor importance, where uh, what seemingly bind the distant people together was this power of socialism. So growing up, growing up uh, as a Yugoslav, only in my early teenage years, I, so to say, discovered my Jewishness. I mean, it was never hidden from me, and I knew that most of my family was executed during the Second World War, but it was not different from anyone else. You know, the concept of Jewishness uh, was uh, subsumed under this uh, general category of victims, just in any other uh, communist country. However... Um, once nationalism gave rise, and I will not discuss that uh, at all because there is a plenty of literature on that subject, I remember I actually recalled uh, for the first time in school being called by someone, actually my best friend, a filthy Jew. And it's, it is literally it's a bad joke. I came home and asked my father, what does it mean to be a Jew? Okay, so to cut the long story short, After all those bloody wars in Croatia, Bosnia, and Kosovo, and severe sanctions Serbia was put through during uh, the Milosevic regime, during the NATO bombardment on Serbia, Kosovo, and Montenegro in 1999, I decided to move to Israel. And just to be sure, not for ideological reasons, but more out of my adventurous spirit, so to say. Well, Israel was shocking to me not only because it didn't match the image of the postcard that were presented to us in the Jewish camps during the night, as you know, those images of falafel and camels and sunny beaches, but because I soon came to face a a huge cognitive gap I was not able to bridge. As I moved away from the wars that were soaked in nationalist ideology, I was not able to understand the fascination with the Israeli army or one-sidedness of the Israeli Jewish narrative and complete marginalization of the Palestinians. I I mean, I would, to be honest, I would probably easily sink into this blind love as most uh, most immigrants do. But as I didn't speak uh, any Hebrew and I didn't want to sound uh, like a child explaining the most basic things, I spent my first year in Israel in Haifa talking almost only with the uh, with Israeli Arabs and this encounter of the marginalized me as a new immigrant and then as Palestinians was in many ways truly significant in the years to come. Okay, now to make things even more complicated, though I became a new immigrant based on the law of return that enables uh, every Jewish descendant to move to Israel, I was truly shocked when a clerk in the Ministry of Inferior told me that I cannot define myself as a Jew. He said, uh, you can choose whatever you want. Uh, You can be an Eskimo as far as I'm concerned, but you cannot say that you're Jewish. Your mother is not Jewish, so you're not Jewish. Naturally, uh, this once again shocked my identity. Well, who am I then? 
I mean, I cannot be Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia doesn't exist anymore. I cannot be Jewish as my mother is not Jewish. And I cannot be Serbian Orthodox as my father is Jewish. So what am I? I mean, all these stories to tell how ascribing and claiming identity or different identities always uh, made me uncomfortable. Uh, at the end of the day, why can't I just decide but from early on, uh, it was clear to me that my identity, whatever that might be, is mirrored through society and is never free from constraints. Uh, it was always clear to me that those boundaries are moving and shifting in times of conflict even more. And now I will add the additional layer. During my MA in general history, I wrote my thesis, uh, thesis on what seems to be a very distant subject that I'm addressing in the book, on <laughs> the costume of women kidnapping for marital purposes in 19th century Serbia. But one thing, though, made me wonder, and later on even defined my preoccupation with memory and memorization processes. How come that girls who were kidnapped, often raped, and experienced extreme forms of uh, violence, their family members were killed or injured, how come did this, those same uh, girls, after some years, recall this event in such a positive light, light, often saying uh, the fact that I was kidnapped means I'm worthy, I'm more beautiful, I'm even chosen. What happens in this gap in which they reframe their own painful memories to fit their present needs? All this is, of course, to highlight, but very selectively, the interplay of my own experience with the intellectual curiosity that eventually led to this book. Because ultimately, this book is about the question what happens uh, when the vacuum in society is filled with competing ideological worldviews and how those clashes shape identities, solidarities, and motivations for action. Leah, that's a, a really fascinating background um, to the book. And having read it, it makes so much sense to see these connections now. But you've just touched upon what I want to, to really move into now, which is, could you tell us a little bit about your motivations in, in the book, about the kind of the, the driving force, the argument that lies behind it? Okay, just to uh, go back to what I previously um, said I mean, in a way, I was unfortunate to, to exchange one conflict, and I refer here to the wars of uh, Yugoslavia, to another, the ongoing conflict between the Israeli Jews and the Palestinians. At some level, I felt like I'm collecting conflicts and, and I'm not able to escape them. But uh, those two uh, are very different in a number of grounds. But what they have in common is the importance of memory and memorization processes for both escalating and de-escalating conflict and the va vast involvement of organizations and NGOs that promote human rights uh, and propose a certain way, a proper way in which all parties are supposed to frame the conflict. And that I think it is similar for many different conflicts uh, across the globe. Uh, with many supporters and many opponents to this particular human rights memorization agenda with enormous budgets and resources invested to promote it, often through transitional justice mechanisms and peace building projects, I kept wondering, what is the real impact on the ground? I mean, at the end of the day, I really wanted to answer one simple question. Do people in general and those who suffered in particular become more appreciative of human rights norms and values once they, so to say, consume those human rights memorization uh, uh, agenda? And the answer is unfortunately no. And we're going to come back to that, <laughs> I think, in a little bit. It's, it's the resounding uh, kind of, I guess, elephant in the room almost. But um, before we do that, could you just outline the general structure and progression of the book? So you've mentioned already that you're looking at these two very different cases, but it would be helpful to just see how the book kind of maps out. Sure. So the book is structured around this notion of moral remembrance, meaning the human rights memorization agenda and it proceeds on three different axes. First, I trace historically and sociologically the emergence of the human rights memorization agenda 
at the global polity level and the ways in which it has been adopted and promoted worldwide. And in a minute, we can talk more about uh, what moral remembrance is. Then I try to understand how this agenda became adopted and promoted in different national post-conflict or in-conflict settings, more precisely here I'm talking about the Western Balkans and Israel and Palestine, through different peace uh, agreements. And finally, I question what are the effects of the human rights uh, memorization agenda on the ground and whether the impl uh, implementation of projects that advance moral remembrance lead to better appreciation of human rights. So uh, I base uh, um, uh, this uh, research uh, on accounts from Serbia, Croatia, uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Israel and Palestine. And I demonstrate that the outcome of such external mandating of normalization standards has quite disturbing results. And it rarely has a transformative power on the ground. In fact, very often, the forging of feeling of solidarity is in small groups, a key to the ideological implementation of human rights, is harvested back by the nation state in order to promote narrow nationalist, ethnically uh, based agendas. In other words, uh, the focus in this book uh, surrounds the question that I would say in today's uh, ideological uh, turmoil, there's much political, moral and policymaking uh, weight. Can the promotion of particular memorization standard, standardized norms in conflict and post-conflict settings ensure the adoption of human rights? Can it defeat or at least dissolve nationalist driven conflict and bring a lasting chance that's about the structure so let's let's circle back to that term moral remembrance because it is so fundamental to to understanding your argument in the book could you perhaps give listeners who might be unfamiliar with this concept an explanation of of what you mean by this and how you've come to use this term Okay, I guess no one is familiar with that because <laughs> I just coined that uh, expression <laughs> of moral remembrance. So yes, I think it des deserves uh, this place uh, uh, and uh, uh, further explanation. So uh, moral remembrance refers to the hum human rights memorization agenda. It refers to the standardized ways promoted through the human rights infrastructures at the global level, as I said, in which societies are supposed to deal with legacies of mass human rights abuses. I mean, this process refers to a gradual uh, accumulative development from duty to remember as an awareness-oriented approach to a contested past, meaning let's talk about it just to be aware what happened, to the policy-oriented proper memorization standards that are understood and promoted as an insurance policy against the repetition of massive human rights abuses, meaning from something that is just a talk into something that is a blueprint. This is uh, grounded in, a, in the presumption that proper memorization is essential for healing societies with a, different, uh, with a difficult past and moving beyond trauma and violence. The way we understand historical injustice today around the globe is shaped predominantly by human rights memorization standards, which I call here moral remembrance, that have over the years adopted three main principles. The necessity to collectively face a troubled past, meaning facing the past, collective duty to remember human rights abuses, and the victim-centered approach that puts victims at the heart of memorization efforts. Again, all this is understood and promoted as an insurance policy meant to prevent the recurrence of violent conflict uh, or conflicts. Though all three of those principles have very different sociological historical trajectories and are rooted in distinct ethical and philosophical ideals, they emerged and became pillars of the human rights memorization agenda. I mean, in fact, the emergence of moral remembrance and the and its uh, extensive promotion via human rights bodies and advocates has shaped our current understanding how the proper way to remember past uh, atrocities and human uh, rights abuses should look like. And that resonates, I would say, uh, 
significantly now with the current uh, movements of uh, historical injustice, whether we talk about uh, Black Lives Matters or uh, any other uh, current uh, movements. And I'm talking here about a, a new global phenomenon, moral remembrance, that have become deeply rooted in human rights memorization practices and norms. It is meant to force states to face and become accountable for past human rights abuses. In that since states are expected, however, just to be sure, not in an even or equal manner to conform to the international human rights norms of facing their criminal past and becoming accountable for massive past human rights abuses. However, all those states often willingly adopt or at least pretend to adopt uh, human rights memorization norms, memorization agendas are, are almost exclusively enforced through different forms of international pressure. I mean, this is because uh, nation states see their natural and exclusive right in promoting memorization agendas as a means to homogenize uh, distant people, meaning... Uh, Nation-state uh, memoriza sponsored memorization process, uh, uh, pro projects were always part of uh, uh, nation-state uh, vocabulary. And now, in a way, it has been uh, uh, resourced uh, or outsourced uh, to international community. And this is important to stress uh, that uh, the human rights memorization agenda is always filtered through the needs of nation-state. And that is important. We will talk about it probably a bit more later. Thank you. And I think that this concept of moral remembrance that you've coined is actually incredibly helpful for those who are working on this topic. And I can see this becoming a, a very useful concept um, in the field. Um, uh, so I, I look forward to seeing how, how scholars working in this area will, will interact with that and, and engage with your your um, your concept. But keeping on this, this topic of, of, of terms and concepts, you know, so much of your work is resting on this unpicking of the connections between, as you've already mentioned, human rights, uh, democracy, and memorialization. Could you just give us a very broad overview of how you're interpreting the interactions between these concepts? Okay, I, maybe I, I will say uh, briefly uh, several sentences about uh, uh, my methodological choices because I, I guess uh, that will explain a bit. So, um, I use this uh, historical sociological method to understand actually how different notions and concept, uh, uh, concepts developed uh, uh, throughout uh, different historical uh, uh, periods. And uh, uh, to trace the emergence of the human rights uh, memorization agenda, I used many documents uh, and policy reports issued by the various human rights bodies and organizations that address memorization processes after uh, massive human rights abuses. And we will talk uh, about it later on, how that actually the whole, um, that field developed. For the chapter on uh, micro solidarity and the ways in which people on the ground uh, internalize or not human rights values, I focused my attention on one particular practice facing the past dialogue encounters or what is called dialogue uh, uh, projects. I mean, we see those all around the world. As I assumed, it bear the best promise for people to adopt human rights values because those encounters are continuous and bring people from distant, different communities together to talk about the conflict. So I um, presume that this is methodologically more accurate to focus my attention on those uh, facing the past dialogue project than to, to let's say, analyze uh, monuments or museums or any other uh, medium that also uh, embodies this uh, notion or this uh, uh, logic of uh, moral remembrance. And here I used whatever was uh, available, to be honest, documentaries and uh, NGO evaluation reports and transcripts and previous studies uh, conducted on the subject. I hope it gives some a brief idea how I develop my concepts. 
Certainly, it certainly does. And you do have a, a very rich methodological background in the book. But let's talk a little bit about um, these six theses that you present, um, which you're, you break down basically in turn over the course of the chapters. And the first of these is explored in chapter two, which is called Human Rights as an Ideology, Obstacles and Benefits. And here you argue that actually interpreting human rights as an ideology is beneficial in understanding how human rights function actually in practice. Could you perhaps explain why you've taken this view of human rights and how it really breaks away from many of the traditional readings about this issue? Yes. Uh, okay. I, I uh, suspect that uh, already at this uh, stage of my work, uh, um, my work might get uh, contested on so many different levels because uh, um, we don't tend to hear often uh, about human rights as an ideology, or if we hear about human rights as an ideology, we think about it in a very negative uh, uh, manner as, as we wanted to curse it or something like that. But I say here something completely different, that as uh, uh, to understand the question that I want to understand how actually those uh, values are implemented or not implemented on the ground, I think that this theoretical model is really helpful. Uh, I mean, the global rise of a moral remembrance model uh, and its alleged ability to, to transform values is best tested, I argue, if we apply theoretical knowledge about ideologies uh, when assessing how values get embedded and accepted on the ground. And here I use the model developed by the leading scholar of nationalism, Professor Sinisha Maleshevich, which shows that any ideology needs three conditions to successfully implement, implement the ideological messaging and values. So first thing is this organizational power, a fancy word that says, that actually describes uh, how institutions, uh, discourses and practices uh, grow and uh, get this organizational power. Meaning the more human rights institutions uh, operate on the ground, the bigger is going to be their power. Second thing is, uh, once we have those institutions in place, they become in charge of promoting certain dogmatic, uh, ideological content power. Uh, in this case, that of moral remembrance of human rights abuses and historical injustice. But the third condition uh, is that the forging of attachments of solidarity between group members that can push them into a moral action based on this uh, ideological uh, uh, reception needs to be apparent on the ground. In other words, both institutions and dogma are necessary, but not sufficient precondition to make human rights an emotionally recruiting ideology. We, have, we need something else to happen on the ground for that ideology to be implemented. So hence, the major question I ask in the book is, once the discourses, practices, and the logic of moral remembrance hit the ground, do people internalize human rights values in the long run? And they present here uh, four major claims. First, that moral remembrance clashes with the nation state sponsored memorization agenda. Second, that moral remembrance, in fact, strengthens the categories of nation and ethnicity, not the other way around. Third, that moral remembrance produces new social inequalities. Yes, that is depressing. And fourth, that moral remembrance does not make people more appreciative of human rights values. Yes, depressing. It's depressing, but it's incredibly convincing. The argument that you make, I think, in this chapter um, is very, very powerful. And I was I was really swayed by um, your argument about human rights as an ideology. But I wanted to kind of shift now a little bit to chapter three um, and touch upon how moral remembrance and its evolution has taken place on, on the global stage, um, as you've already mentioned. And, and you draw attention to how the human rights memorialization agenda has been based on what you've already mentioned as three core pillars. So this is facing the past, the duty to remember, and justice for victims. And they're all these kind of tropes that, that ring very familiar um, in 2020. And a really important event in this history is the UN's adoption of memorialization standards in 2014. Could you perhaps explain to listeners what these standards are, how they came about, and some of the issues that they pose? 
Yeah, sure. And again, maybe to go back uh, uh, to those uh, um, axes that we need in order to understand it uh, uh, as an ideology, we need, first of all, institutions, and then we have uh, uh, we need to have a certain content. So actually, in this chapter, I really unpack uh, this emergence uh, of the uh, human rights memorization agenda. So, you know, moral remembrance uh, prescribes standards of a proper way of remembrance of the past atrocities. And the institutionalization proper of, of the human rights memorization agenda started, I would say, in 1948, immediately with the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And although the declaration was not tailored to address memory issues per se at all, it is the single most important statement of ethics and uh, world vision, and its uh, authority is unparalleled even for memorization processes. However, at the beginning, the human rights understanding of memorization processes uh, was developed only on the fringes of the core human rights agenda. You know, Second World War and the Holocaust led to a whole range of normative and institutional uh, changes that primarily focused on preventing human rights suffering uh, that took memory really for granted. Uh, the importance of memory surfaced only gradually in the years that followed. Uh, though the processes uh, by which individuals and groups remember or forget the past has been a concern for centuries, the rapid growth of memorization across the globe during the 80s and the 90s might be explained by the fact that memorization became a crucial representation for the identity politics struggle. And I'm saying here in particular since the 80s and even more in the 90s when identity politics established uh, the importance of witnesses after the Soviet empire uh, collapsed in, 19, in 1989, it became clear to all parties involved in the process of memory construction that memory is not a guaranteed right, but it is a privilege. And the increasing importance of memory also has to do both with the development in technology, of course, and the inclusion of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, in the 80s as a recognized medical diagnostic clarification, classification, sorry, because once accepted as a syndrome, PTSD validated not only rights uh, to pensions, uh, medical care, uh, and public sympathy, but also the commemoration of traumatic memory. I mean, those uh, processes of, so to say, obsession with memory uh, coincided with the dilemmas experienced in the 80s by human rights activists, lawyers, legal scholars, policymakers, uh, journalists, donors, uh, uh, political experts in relation to places such as Korea and Chile and South Africa and Brazil and Uruguay and Guatemala and Haiti and Poland and other places that were concerned with human rights and the dynamics of transition to democracy. A new sort of human rights activity was generated, coined transitional justice and understood as and here I want to use a quote, the full range of processes and mechanisms associated with the society's attempt to come to terms with a legacy of large-scale past abuses in order to ensure accountability, justice, and achieve reconciliation. Big words, yes. A transitional justice included criminal prosecutions, uh, truth commissions, reparation programs, and various kinds of institutional reforms. The paradigm of transitional justice, which included not only juridical, but also political and social mechanisms with a strong focus on memorialization, was intensively promoted from the late uh, 1980s uh, on and has become, together with peace building, the main ideological force behind the human rights uh, memorialization agenda. Well, this institutionalization of transitional justice as part of human rights agenda became potent with this, what they call organizational power to put pressure on states to comply with norms set by transitional justice institutions, which also included memorization processes. But to impact memorization processes on the ground, different organizations and institutions and NGO bodies through the work of 
uh, knowledge-based uh, expert groups gradually develop policy recommendations and briefings. And together with principles of reparations, the UN General Assembly in 2005 discussed in length the principles of normalization standards as pillars of the broader issue of reparation, arguing that, th that this uh, principle may bring about reconciliation in divided societies. And they are to be considered as the best uh, roadmap uh, for memorization uh, processes. I mean, there are two important reports uh, issued in 2013 and 2014, one on history textbooks uh, and the second on the standards of memory that were presented uh, at the UN General Assembly. So they put forward standards of proper memorization saying, and I quote, Western memorial models commemorating the victims of Nazism, while not always the most adequate or appropriate, have become a template, or at least a political and aesthetic inspiration for the representation of past tragedies of mass crimes. So this sets the uh, whole tone, uh, how actually Holocaust uh, became a model uh, for these uh, uh, standards of memory. And we see this culminating in 2013 and 2014, memorialization has become mainstream within the field of cultural rights. However, many other memorialization policy briefings were issued, and not only by, by the UN, but also by the US Institute of Peace uh, and many other NGOs. And here, I think it is uh, worth of mentioning a Dutch-based NGO, Impunity Watch, that issues several memorialization policies for uh, um, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Guatemala, South Africa, uh, for Burma, Indonesia, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and many other places, together with, with what also became the main uh, uh, memorialization uh, document, Guiding Principles for Memorialization, issued in 2013, and later in 2014, Memory for Change, Memorialization as a tool for transitional justice. So we see actually how uh, this growth, exponential growth of the importance of uh, memorializations uh, for post-conflict uh, settings. So all those memorialization policy reports both were shaped by the experience, uh, but also were shaping the practices, discourses, and vocabulary on the ground just to promote this agenda of moral remembrance when there is a kind of there is a proper way to rem to remember the, the past that will ensure that we will not go back to violence and let's move to that ground now, because although you do explore the global and institutional level, you know, what really sets your book apart in the field is how it's digging down actually into um, kind of the ground, the roots level um, of how this is working. So the following chapter, so after you discuss um, the global stage, move to a, a series of case studies um, to explore how moral remembrance plays out in specific localities. And you focus first on Israel and Palestine and the different genealogies of, of Holocaust and Nakma um, memory construction, which you present as being polarized, but nevertheless very interlinked. Now, this is, of course, a, a huge, uh, it's a difficult and it's a vast subject. So I'd like to really kind of bury down um, a little bit and ask you specifically about the role of the Oslo Accords in these memorialization processes. So could you firstly maybe just give listeners an overview of what these accords were um, and then perhaps explain what their role was in the institutionalization of moral remembrance? Okay, just briefly, again, this chapter was there just to show how those uh, uh, peace agreements enabled the entrance of this moral remembrance agenda. So this chapter brings to the fore the encounters uh, of mutually contested memories of the Palestinian Nakba on the one hand and the Jewish Holocaust on the other hand to understand how they were shaped by political needs but also how they produced very different political uh, engagements. So the construction of those memorialization discourses is discussed uh, in three distinctive ways. First, both the Nakba and the Holocaust have their own unique developing trajectories formed as a result of local political needs and special carrier groups, of course. Second, 
they developed both in relation to and in opposition to one another. So this is also important to stress. And third, they were both subject to particular global trends. And here I want to introduce, and in my chapter, I introduce actually the Oslo Accords. I give a brief contextualization of the historical and political and social background of the Oslo Accords that was signed in 1993, and the ways in which they enable the implementation of moral remembrance in local realities. So I show that despite the fact that historical and collective memories were almost entirely absent from the Oslo peace uh, processes, the human rights memorization agenda was adopted and heavily funded. I mean, that is the paradox. The Oslo Accords of course, refers here uh, to peace agreement signed between the government of Israel on one hand and the Palestinian Liberation um, Organization, PLO, on the other hand, uh, first in Washington in 1993 and then in Taba, Egypt, 1995. So the Oslo Accords that projected the independent state of Palestine in 1999 were of great importance for bringing new memorization agenda, never discussed per se, and that is, again, paradox, uh, in any legal document, but indirectly promoted in multiple ways. In a way, uh, the human rights memorization agenda was sneaked in uh, through the back door of the agreement because the ideological framework adopted in the Oslo Accords uh, was based on a report by the UN then uh, Secretary General Butros Butros Ghali uh, on his uh, document entitled An Agenda for Peace, preventive diplomacy, peacemaking, and peacekeeping. And this document brought uh, for the first time the concept of peace building as a core principle of Oslo Accords. And <laughs> this is, uh, um, to, that goes also with my point how this uh, memorization agenda has been um, sneaked in and adopted on the ground, even in 2000, when it became clear that Oslo Accords uh, had failed Surprisingly, memorization practices promoted by human rights institutions and funds continued to blossom. So this explains, I think, uh, briefly how that uh, chapter is conceptualized. And then you move on to the Western Balkans as kind of a, a foil almost. Um, and 2020 was, as I'm sure many listeners are aware, the 25th anniversary of the genocide. And there have been all sorts of commemorations, both nationally and internationally, that have, have taken place this year. Now, the book, of course, um, although published this year, was finished before the commemorations took place in most um, circumstances. But I was really wondering if you would like to perhaps put your arguments regarding memorialization in the, the Western Balkans into dialogue with the form and tone of some of the 2020 commemorations that perhaps you've, you've witnessed or, or read about. Uh, sure. Just uh, maybe to bring it back and put it in a, a kind of... Um, uh, relationship with a previous uh, case study. So the ba Western Balkans case provides a radically different picture from that of Israel and Palestine. I mean, the Dayton peace agreement was tailored for the peace uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but it also had a significant spilling effect uh, on Serbia and Croatia, and it was signed in 1995. The Dayton agreement, as opposed to the Oslo Accords, opened the door for the Europeanization process that explicitly required uh, the adjusting of histories uh, to the human rights memorization agenda. I mean, for Serbia, Croatia, and Bosnia, the pressure posed uh, by international community in general and by uh, the EU in particular was given from the very beginning. Following the wars in the 90s, they all formally committed to the Europeanization processes. I mean, each, each state's uh, entrance to the EU was uh, conditioned upon, among other things, facing its criminal past uh, and adoption of human rights. So now let's get, go back to Srebrenica. I think that what is happening uh, with the Srebrenica commemorations is very indicative of the ways in which people on the ground, as well as the local political elites, uh, adopt and adapt to those prescribed uh, nor norms of normalization. It really goes to the main argument of the book. Even when governments uh, adopt normalization standards, at least allegedly, uh, and practices, and they perform those, it says 
little or nothing on the adoption of human rights values on the ground. And uh, for all sorts of reasons, the issue of normalization and remembrance ends up being reduced to trade and bargain where memory content is used as a currency to exchange uh, benefits, uh, voting electorate, uh, access to various resources uh, between uh, those who suffered human rights abuses and those who are in power. And here I mean not only the political elite, but also international local NGOs. And this is precisely what we see in case of Srebrenica, this endless trade of uh, memory uh, shifting from one side to another. Would you be able to actually, just for those who perhaps are, are not um, aware of what actually took place this year, what what are the types of commemorations that were taking place um, as, as a memorial this year? For, you mean for Srebrenica? Yeah, for Srebrenica. So uh, <laughs> Srebrenica commemorations were expected to be really voluminous this year because, as you said, it was 25 years uh, uh, commemorating uh, the gen genocide, but uh, they were obviously affected like everything else uh, by uh, the coronavirus. So they had to do everything uh, actually online. It is, It had, a, I would say, a very significant impact, if it is possible to say, because so many different things were going on. So uh online so they had a line of different uh, uh programs uh, testimonials uh, and this uh, beautiful uh installation uh, artistic installation with uh, coffee cups that was uh, moving uh, from one place to another in bosnia resembling uh, uh those missing people and uh, those missing talks with people and their life i think that was a really very powerful uh, uh, commemor commemorative message, uh, if uh, we can say. But on the other hand, because of this uh, uh, need to move online, um, it ended up that we actually couldn't see anyone going there and uh, performing those apologies as uh, President Serbian President Vucic did five years ago when uh, he came to Srebrenica after being... Uh, uh, in a way pressured and forced by the international community to uh, apologize publicly again. This uh, public apologies is a very significant part of this uh, moral remembrance repertoire uh, that has, as we will see, very, very, very different uh, outcomes from what uh, has been envisioned to start with. So he went there, uh, came uh, to Srebrenica and actually uh got stoned and her glasses were broken and he had to flee the stage but it uh, ended up uh framing him as a victim because he went there and he did what was expected from him but he was not welcome so we see this the the this troubling uh, spill out from this uh, uh standardized way in which uh, we are supposed to uh, perform uh, practices um, and the norms uh, in a way in both local and international arenas, uh, they often end up with completely different results. And you do focus in the book um, on these types of apologies um, that you've mentioned. And it's a, it's very good for, for listeners, you know, if you want an account of Willy Brandt as compared to, to Vucic, you know, uh, of giving these public apologies, um, the book gives quite a, a rich account of this and, and the, the I guess, the repercussions that come from such apologies. But I'd like to come back to just um, the comparisons that you were making um, between Israel and Palestine um, and the Western Balkans. And it's it's very clear, considering the, the content of the book, why you've chosen these um, as case studies. But could you perhaps um, expand a little bit more on, on how these comparisons between these different cases contribute to your refinement of this concept of moral remembrance? <laughs> Okay, just briefly about that, about that, because I think I mentioned it also previously. Uh, I mean, this comparison between Israel, Palestine, and Serbia, uh, Croatia, and Bosnia is not random. And uh, as I mentioned, those uh, conflicts uh, differ significantly, which was uh, partially um, the reason why I wanted to take them, because I wanted to see if they're so different, what happens if we focus 
on memory and memorization uh, policies, uh, can we actually understand something common uh, about conflicts that are so different? So, and why? Because they have in common uh, this uh, centrality of memory embedded in the conflict. So for Israel and Palestine, the centrality of the Holocaust legacy serves as a diversion from Palestinian suffering, a fundamental issue in their already seven decades long conflict. And for Serbia, Croatia and Bosnia, contested memories from different historical layers uh, affect the region in every possible sense and in making it a spark away yet from another conflict. So in both settings, however, attempts uh, to mandate the remembrance of uh, past human rights abuses through the global human rights infrastructure actually ends up uh, in perp uh, perpetuation of those conflicts and not in the promotion of human rights. So that was really interesting for me because in the conflicts that are so, so different on so many different grounds, we actually see that conclu conclusion is, uh, is the same. So you then move on and drill even further down into the ground in chapter six, which is called human rights, memory and micro solidarity. And, and you're really examining here how moral remembrance comes into conflict with nationalist and ethnic collective memory on the ground. So solidarity is not something that's usually factored into this constellation of concepts. So I was wondering if you could expand on how solidarity and in particular this micro solidarity that you um, that you focus on connect to both human rights and memory in the context that you've studied? Again, for me, this chapter was uh, uh, make it or break it. I think that's the crucial chapter, actually. Uh, also for this um, uh, theoretical concept conceptualization of uh, human rights as an ideology. Because again, uh, so far I was talking about institutions and I was talking about the content. But here I really wanted to dig deep and to see what happens on the ground. And uh, uh, in that sense, uh, I had to go into this uh, notion of uh, micro-solidarity. Uh, the concept of micro-solidarity as a solidarity that develops within small-scale face-to-face encounters relies on the threefold axis uh, of ideology. As I said, we have institutions, we have content, and finally, solidarity as a crucial element to elevate certain worldviews and push people into a collective action. And in that sense, I used uh, Randall Collins uh, with his uh, book, uh, Interaction Ritual Chains, who made a major contribution to uh, our understanding uh, of the development of micro-solidarity <clears throat> in small group encounters. So drawing on numerous human rights projects and normalization initiatives uh, in both the Western Balkans and in Israel-Palestine, I analyzed, as I said previously, facing the past dialogue groups that bring people from opposing communities together, such as, for example, victims and perpetrators uh, from different ethnic communities. So facing the past encounters ritualize actually historical narratives and they generate strong emotions uh, between uh, participants such as anger and fear and excitement and pain and together uh, they also build a particular voc uh, vocabulary of sentiments which i show end up strengthening ethnic homogenization and group uh, polarization and i'll give you here an example Let's take, for example, a participant who is a Moroccan uh, Jewish, so who has no direct family experience of the Holocaust. He starts this program as an individual, completely different with other Jewish or Palestinian participants. But during the course of the dialogue project, uh, this participant will internalize the Holocaust narrative as an essential element, element of the Jewish identity. And by the end of the project, um, he will start talking what they call we talk, moving from I as a form of uh, individual identity, I do this, I like this, to we talk as a collective, ethnically bound identity, meaning uh, we often see people like him ending up saying, we who suffered Holocaust at the end of those projects. And I think this is 
fascinating because it, it achieves completely different uh, result uh, from the desired one. And <laughs> the, uh, we have those practices around the world and they're funded uh, uh, enormously. Why? Because uh, while in those face-to-face -face groups, it is often reported that this uh, uh, ex uh, experience is a life-changing experience. I've never felt like that. I felt, uh, uh, in a way, enlightened to see that, you know, uh, this Palestinian is actually a human being and all kind of narratives of uh, uh, rehumanization of the other. Uh, and it even produces real feelings of solidarity. This is actually what we often see in those uh, NGO reports uh, among the group members. In the long run, though, uh, we see that this solidarity does not translate into uh, human rights uh, uh, values for all sorts of reasons. In other words, a moral remembrance does not offer a, a real alternative to sustaining those emotions and transforming them into a solid, long-lasting human rights values. In fact, I argue that moral remembrance does not offer sufficient infrastructures to compete with the narrow ethnically based nationalist uh, perception of collective memory, but instead often ends up reproducing those uh, nationalist uh, narratives uh, and practices, just as I mentioned in my previous example. And I think what's also so striking about this chapter is, you know, we're, we're all aware of, of these programs and these groups and these initiatives. Um, but it's just how many they are that they are in number um, and and how much funding and how much um, dedication has really gone into these um, kind of face to face encounters um, that's something that I found found really striking and and for those who are who are interested in this topic um, you, you know your book gives a really very rich account of of um, the kind of short term history of this um, so I'd really recommend uh, reading it for that purpose maybe just one uh, sense, sentence sentence. Uh... Uh, they're uh, hugely funded, again, because uh, this uh, short-term effect uh, always says uh, they're life-changing, but also they're really fun. You know, they're really fun because they uh, take people out of their own, you know, bleak realities. Uh, and actually, the most um, significant part of those programs or those projects is what happens uh, backstage, not when they talk about histories, but when they laugh, when they play uh, guitar, when they talk, uh, tell jokes and things like that. That actually bears potential, not the other way around. So I just wanted to clarify that. No, and, it's, and I think it's very important to say that, you know, in, in spite of, the, you know, the claims that you make are, are very powerful and, and very kind of direct, but you, you are also incredibly measured and temperate in, you know, the conclusions that you draw at the end. You know, this is not a criticism um, necessarily of the concept of human rights and human rights, generally speaking, um, and all of these projects. I think it's just a very um, measured critique of, of perhaps how we can go about things um, in a better and more productive, perhaps, way. Um, but on that note, I'd like to move then to your final chapter. And, and this is where you reflect on the significance and possible dangers of the new global moral remembrance regime. And one part of this um, you explore is, is what you describe as the Europeanization of the Holocaust, um, which I found particularly striking and, and very, very interesting. Could you, could you explain to listeners what you mean by this um, and perhaps what this process of Europeanization tells us about the interactions between nationalist sentiment on the one hand and moral remembrance? Well, uh, this notion of uh, Europeanization of the Holocaust uh, has been, to be honest, widely researched. Uh, there is already a significant literature that shows uh, how the Holocaust remembrance was put forward as a unifying project uh, for the needs of, of the EU, where vast historical and national differences were supposed to be solved by, in a way, equaling Holocaust remembrance uh, with human rights values, meaning European values. Uh, this uh, Europeanized version of the Holocaust remembrance rests precisely on those three principles uh, of moral remembrance. We as a community need to face our troubled past. Just pay attention, it's a, it stays unclear who are we here. 
we have a duty to remember and to remember victims in uh, particular. So uh, this uh, uh, Europeanization of the Holocaust remembrance, uh, as I said, uh, we can we can see in uh, uh, standardized uh, history books, uh, in standardized uh, versions of the Holocaust museums, that they though might uh, look completely different, actually their content, their bare content is uh, quite standardized and really uh, the same. And in that sense, moral remembrance, when using the Holocaust remembrance as a template, is actually uh, ending up in uplifting the category of victims to a celebratory status of a hero, which in turn opens up a political space for claiming victim, a victimhood status, both on an individual and a collective level. But here is the thing. Though human rights memorization agenda is allegedly tailored to encourage victims to speak, uh, to remain, to keep this purified status of victims, one has to adopt a particular narrative and to filter memory content that does not fit this particular purified narrative. For example, a rape victim in Bosnia. To keep this status of a victim and consequently the benefits will often not report that she moved on, got married, maybe even has uh, children, let's say, because she has to fit the simplified narrative of a victim, because once a victim, always a victim. Another issue with moral remembrance is that actively enables transmission of those simplified character uh, categories of victims, perpetrators, and bystanders, and not the other way around. For example, uh, members of the third generation of Houthi in Belgium are still marked as perpetrators, though many of them have never even been in Rwanda. Not just the descendants of uh, uh, Holocaust survivors are still regarded as victims, but practically all Jews, regardless of their uh, geography or age, are regarded and treated as victims. And often we see how they use that status. Paradoxically, under the pretense of moving beyond the uh, ethnic uh, uh, divisions, the logic of moral remembrance, in fact, advances the generational transmission of these fixed categories, making them almost impossible to escape. So it actually binds a categorical system of victims, perpetrators, and bystanders to their ethnic and religious identity and not to human beings as a whole. And to start with, the whole purpose of human rights was to place, you know, focus on human beings. Thus, moral remembrance produces on the ground endless struggles and politics over victimhood, actively producing hierarchies of suffering and ending up in promoting some victim groups while many others stay completely marginalized. As a consequence, we often witness two outcomes. A re eruption of ethnic hostilities and new social inequalities. So, this is important. Why social inequalities? Well, because in practice, this means that for both human rights groups and for political elites, the suffering party can gain status only through the position of victims, which needs, as I said, to be constantly reaffirmed. It is precisely here in the day-to-day -day politics of victimhood, the new social inequalities are being produced. This process of reaffirming victim status has two direct implications. First, the need of, uh, uh, for this ideal type of victim means that victim groups inevitably, and not only that, often in a very conscious manner, engage in homogenizing their group members. Uh, meaning they are selecting only and, and accepting only group members that can perform this simplified uh, ideal uh, victimhood. The side effect of such uh, homogene homogenization pro uh, process results in an attempt to sanction any complexities or messiness as it might jeopardize the victim position in the power struggle between two opposing camps, that of the human rights, and of nationally centered ideologies. Just imagine those victim groups that are actually uh, trying to get attention from both those camps and attention, uh, benefits, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Secondly, 
And even more importantly, this uh, process of uh, homogenizing and pushing of the victim groups into this framework of ideal victims means that other victim group uh, groups become understood as rivals and opponents in the struggle for scarce resources. And in reality, this means that both the nationalist and human rights centered ideologies, ideolog ideologies are often used to form new class divisions that is based on differential access to state power and bureaucratic uh, apparatus, as well as to external funding. In other words, what I'm trying to say, uh, if a group manages to, uh, keep, to reinforce this uh, uh, status of ideal victims that is uh, clean of any contestation and messiness, it has chance to actually apply uh, for different fundings. If not, there is no place for messiness in this uh, system of, uh, of uh, moral remembrance. And so that's why we see how this actually um, that moral remembrance is uh, perpetuating and producing new social inequalities on the ground. And that leads so nicely into my final question, Leah. Um, I'd like to turn now to the title of your book, which is The Past Can't Heal Us. And when we speak about memory and memorialization, we often speak, um, as you've just mentioned, um, about the activities of remembering and forgetting, about accepting and healing, and about victims and of perpetrators. You know, in your view, to what extent is this language really the product of the moral remembrance agenda? And how might we speak about history and about memory and trauma and human rights without opting into this unified, homogenous discourse? I would say it is entirely the project uh, uh, of the moral remembrance agenda. I mean, we literally have no other vocabulary developed to address issues of memory, trauma and suffering. But it is even more than that. Uh, I would say moral remembrance is deeply intertwined with this neoliberal thinking where we often tend to place symbolic or monetary values on human suffering, whether through apologies, uh, erection of monuments and museums, or through demands for restitution or reparations. And placing capitalist value on individual or group suffering tends to reinforce, uh, to reinforce victimization hierarchies, national sentiments, and it ends up producing new social inequalities, as I, as I mentioned before. This is ultimately wrong for the simple fact, I mean, because life is worth more than we uh, should, and we should not reduce it only to this uh, uh, simple price list. I mean... I would say that uh, the first step, the step to build different vocabulary and more important, different visions of the possible futures has to start with simply realizing the threat of the human rights memorization agenda. And that is a very um, salient point that I think listeners can take away. Leah, thank you so much um, for, for revealing you know, all about the book. Um, I've, I've enjoyed our interview greatly. But before we let you go, could you just give us a quick glimpse into what you're currently working on? Okay, so uh, in a bit, I'm, in, in a way, I'm continuing uh, with uh, those issues because I'm deeply interested uh, in those well-embedded presumptions and vocabulary or as I call them, holy cows, uh, what we take for granted and we forget to question them along the way, such as uh, if we properly face the past, it will not repeat, or people who suffered can understand better uh, others' uh, suffering, or we can heal the nation, or um, we need to bring back dignity uh, to people who suffered, or this expression of innocent victims. I mean, there are many tropes that we are actually using, and I think uh, they're very troubling, and they just uh, bring us back into this uh, uh, trap uh, uh, that produces all those uh, unfortunate outcomes that they explained uh, during this interview. Those are just some examples uh, where the historical and sociological development of such presumptions are vastly ignored, which means that we often start a conversation or a research on a false premises. And that is both troubling and really dangerous. And finally, I mean, because if we get the wrong train, we will never reach the destination, no matter how long that we travel. 
thank you for that. Well, that sounds like a fascinating um, piece of work and perhaps we can we can discuss it on the show in, in the future. Leah, thank you so much um, for this interview. The book is The Past Can't Heal Us, The Dangers of Mandating Memory in the Name of Human Rights by Leah David. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me, Alexandra. Thank you. I really enjoyed it.